The third O'Donnell awardee is by Dr. Julie Pfeiffer of UT Southwestern Medical Center. Dr. Pfeiffer holds the Wildenthal President's Research Council Professorship in Medical Science at UT Southwestern Medical Center. Dr. Pfeiffer's groundbreaking work is redefining how we think about life-threatening viral infections. She has discovered new ways that bacteria in the body can affect whether or not we get sick from viruses. Her research has shown that viruses in the gut rely on in intestinal bacteria to infect us. This has resulted in a new discipline in microbiology. Thanks to her work, we now know that antibiotics can have antiviral effects, which is already driving research into new treatments for viruses. Dr. Fine. Thank you so much. So thank you so much both to Tamist and the O'Donnell Foundation for this wonderful surprise and great honor. It's been a great meeting and I'm super excited to be here. And today I'm going to tell you about some of our work on viruses and we're really passionate about viruses. So I start out with this quote from Peter Medawar a virus is a piece of bad news wrapped in protein. And this is really true. So there's a nucleic acid genome surrounded by protein. Some of them have a lipid envelope, but many don't, and that's it. And so many virologists think that viruses aren't even alive because Oh, it's back. Okay. Yeah, I can use this. Use that. As long as we don't get that really scary background noise. <laughs> They'll make sure you know. They, okay. Um, so we're interested in a lot of different uh, viruses, specifically enteric viruses, as was alluded to. So viruses that infect the gastrointestinal tract. I'm okay using this one. Okay. We're good? Okay. Perfect. So we're really interested in enteric viruses that infect the gastrointestinal tract. And so we're interested in several different enteric viruses, some maybe of which you've heard of, like norovirus and rotavirus, norovirus being the famous two-bucket disease. You definitely don't want it. <laughs> But some of these viruses, it turns out, are hard to study. So in my lab, we've been really, really passionate about model systems. And so we've used things like Reovirus and Coxsackie virus that most of you probably haven't heard of. And importantly, we've used poliovirus for a lot of our work. So poliovirus, you may know because of the paralytic disease, but actually this is an enteric virus that only occasionally went rogue to cause paralytic disease. And so it causes paralysis in less than 1% of infected people, even in the pre-vaccine era. So this is just an accidental side effect. Um, of course, the vaccines have been wildly successful. I'll touch on that more in a minute, to the point where we've almost eradicated it from the planet. It's an incredible accomplishment. So you can see the map on the left in 1988 of the world and the polio incidents versus just a couple of years ago. This has been incredibly dramatic. So why on earth would we be working on a virus that's basically cured and eradicated? Um, I get asked that a lot. Uh, so why study polio? So it's been studied for over 100 years. Um, so there's great knowledge. It's actually really safe to work on because we just vaccinate lab members. And so if there's a new person in the lab, I prefer them to start with polio, ironically, because it's really the safest thing we work on. Um, but mostly it's the reagents, resources, knowledge that lends it great tractability. So if you're gonna tackle a really tough question, it's nice to have a really tractable system. And I'd like to show you what I mean by that in terms of the history of polio. So I've graphed out here the number of publications per year, and you can see that starts in 1879. So this has a really robust life history of people studying this virus. Um, you can see this massive uptick that coincides with funding, not surprisingly. The March of Dimes, which was an incredibly successful campaign, small donations from many that really revolutionized fundraising. Um, 
so that was one important thing. The second important thing was the development of HeLa cells, which I think a lot of people in the room have heard about that story. Um, and that's because you couldn't grow the virus in the lab easily without them. So that led to two fantastic vaccines, the Salk vaccine and the Sabin vaccine. And you can see a drop in you know, papers after that, predictably. But interestingly, there's been this uptick because people have been using it as a model system to understand how viral proteins can be made and how it's different from regular host cell machinery and so forth. So it's kind of become like the fruit fly or yeast of the viral world. Contrast this with Zika virus, same time scale, right? But what's lacking is that whole left part of that curve, right? Nobody worked on Zika virus until it blew up and we knew nothing about it. And so this is where I think working with a really tractable virus is key. And so when I first started my lab in 2006, we were interested in several questions, including why did so few people develop paralytic disease? Because once you understand that for polio, you can understand it for other neurotropic viruses as well. And so we created a panel of what I call barcoded viruses that differ from one another by point mutations so we can tell them apart. And this is important because it may be difficult for the virus to reach the central nervous system, but once it gets there, it replicates like crazy. So you can't just rely on how much virus is there. But by using these barcodes, you can figure out there's loss of population diversity. And so two graduate students in the lab, Sharon Coos and Karen Lancaster, really worked out this system. And just to briefly summarize some of their results, if they orally inoculate susceptible mice with this 10 virus mixture, Look what comes out in feces. They poop out all 10, no problem. But what was a problem was viruses taking hold in the gut. So we saw a limited capacity there. And then only one of the variants would frequently make it to the brain, suggesting there's a barrier. We've been studying these barriers. Uh, one fun one for the neuroscience crowd is we found that although the virus can enter neurons very readily, it undergoes very inefficient retrograde axonal trafficking, and we developed a sciatic nerve model to be able to look at that in vivo. But the barrier I want to talk about today is the gastrointestinal tract, which, as you can see here, is also a really important barrier. And we wondered, do gut bacteria inhibit viral movement to other tissues? So a little bit of background, just using this slide from friend and colleague Laura Hooper. This is a mouse gastrointestinal tract. You can see the tissue in blue on the bottom the bacteria stained uh, in green here, and there's this demilitarized zone, she would call it, of mucus that's really protecting your tissue. And of course, there's a huge number of bacteria in the gut, and they play all kinds of important roles, um, including potentially several um, in the neuroscience field. So in about 2008, we came up with this hypothesis, and maybe the commensal good bacteria in the gut inhibit viral replication. And we had two reasons to, to put forth that hypothesis. First, there was a well-known phenomenon of colonization resistance where commensal bacteria in the gut were known to inhibit colonization of bacterial pathogens, things like E. coli, Shigella, Salmonella, things like that. So we wondered maybe the same thing might be true for viruses. The second reason was actually social. And this has to do with bacteriologists, friends, and colleagues. And so I just want to give you a brief history kind of of my life at UT Southwestern. So microbiology departments all over the country, virologists and bacteriologists are very separate. They don't tend not to talk to each other, and they're all siloed out by their own model organism. Um, however, in 2007, I found myself the only virologist <laughs> in the department. However, I was lucky that the bacteriologists adopted me, became friends with them, and got really interested in what they were doing. And so that's really what stimulated everything I'm about to tell you. I will say that now we have a really robust department. We all talk to each other, and a lot of us collaborate in between these disciplines. So it's been absolutely fantastic. And on the acknowledgment slide, I'll touch on some of these green and blue dots. And wouldn't you want to collaborate with these people, right? These are the bacteriology colleagues who wouldn't want to collaborate with them. They're wonderful people. So a brave graduate student, Sharon Coos, took, took this on, and she asked a very simple question. If she antibiotic treats mice with a cocktail of several antibiotics and knocks down the flora, what happens? So in standard mice, poliovirus replicated and cause disease when you orally inoculate them. But in the antibiotic-treated mice with the depleted bacteria, 
the virus hardly replicated and was much less pathogenic. Um, so gut bacteria seem to be required for poliovirus replication and disease, and if you'll remember, that is exactly the opposite of what we were going in with, which to me makes it way more interesting. So then a couple of questions come out of that naturally. First, would this be applicable to other enteric viruses? Because if it was polio specific, I don't know how many people would care. Uh, fortunately, this ends up being really broadly applicable. So Sharon showed it was true for poliovirus and an unrelated enteric virus, rheovirus. And then several group, other groups have contributed with a mouse retrovirus called MMTV and then noroviruses of various flavors. And I'll have more to say in a minute about the labs working in this new field. It's an incredibly robust and fun place to be. The second question then is why? How does all this work? Um, so it could be that the bacteria are affecting the host environment, and we know from work from others that that's true. Bacteria seem to dampen immune responses in the gut. And we've been looking more at the idea that the bacteria can directly interact with viral particles and maybe alter their infectivity. And so I'm not gonna show you any data. This is my detailed molecular mechanism slide. And it was drawn by Sharon, that graduate student, to show her thesis project. And Sharon is a native Texan. And so we have a poliovirus virion cowboy um, riding on a bacterium, holding on to glycan polysaccharide brains while lassoing the viral receptor on this host cell to initiate infection. And we think that's a pretty accurate de depiction. So we know of two benefits the virus gets from this. It enhances receptor binding so that it can infect that first cell more readily. And the second thing is it makes the virus more stable in the environment so it can be on that doorknob for longer before it's inactivated. We know quite a bit about these interactions. We've mapped all the glycans that are sufficient and not. We know a bit about where the binding is on the viral particle. Uh, we have a mutant virus that binds less, and we've been able to probe function using that. So it's been a really fun system. We can also directly visualize these interactions. So Palmy in the lab uses EM. And of course, polio is tiny. It's about the size of a ribosome, so it's kind of hard to see by EM, but you can see in this image viral particles directly interacting with bacteria. But Palmy's favorite thing to do is image rheovirus because it's much larger, and so you can actually see it quite readily. On the right there is two E. coli cells studded with all of these rheovirus particles. We call that the rheovirus necklace. And these images really changed the way we thought about the infection process because, of course, the host cell would be huge in comparison to these things. And so we think not only are you getting the virus from the previous person that pooped it out, you're also ingesting their fecal bacteria, which is wonderful to think about. <laughs> also, we have multiple viral particles bound to each bacterium, and so we started thinking maybe they could deliver, these bacteria could deliver more than one viral particle per host cell. And Andrea Erickson, a research scientist in the lab, was able to show this using a lot of molecular trickery using old polio mutants, and she showed that in fact, a bacteria could deliver more than one viral particle and it could actually resurrect defective viral genomes and make them virulent again. So bacteria are aiding viral infection in this way, which stimulated one Twitter user to say, I always suspected the little bastards were in cahoots, which I just love. <laughs> so we know that bacteria promote enteric virus replication and transmission. We have this common theme, we have these four different families of enteric viruses that all bind bacteria and or bacterial surface glycans, uh, but there are distinct mechanisms. So we know that they can affect viral particles and they can also affect host immune responses. And I alluded to the fact that this field has been fun to be in. It's largely driven by a group of female faculty at different institutions all over the country that have been labeled the poop sisters by our virology colleagues. Um, so it's been absolutely fantastic to be a part of this growing community. One really short story on Stephanie Karst, the poop sister there on the right. So Stephanie studies human norovirus, Norwalk, for example, you may have heard of, the cruise ship virus, the dreaded cruise ship virus. It's incredibly common, absolutely miserable, and it's been unculturable for over 40 years. People have tried to culture this thing forever using every technique possible. As a consequence, you have to use human volunteer studies. I mean, can you, how much would they have to pay you? Um, the problem was when people were culturing it, so Stephanie knew me in our work, and she thought, maybe the problem is we're filtering out the bacteria. They take the stool, they filter it, you don't want to contaminate your cell culture. 
That was the problem. So she was finally able to get this virus to grow in cells in the lab for the first time just by adding the bacteria back. And so this is an example of how work on a model virus that, quite frankly, very few people care about can really inform biology of the greater community. So then what's next? Um, we have a lot of enteric virus projects still ongoing. That's still the bulk of what the lab does. However, I have a really talented postdoc, Ariel Woznica, who was just named an HHMI Hannah Gray Fellow, and we spend a lot of time looking at the tree of life. And she's really interested in this divergence of when we became animals, these coanoflagellates, I'll touch on in a minute. Characterized viruses were very obsessed, of course, with humans, mammals. Um, there's been some studies on, of course, bacteriophage and viruses that infect plants, uh, but really there's a huge gap there in the middle. And the other interesting thing, of course, is there are a lot of major innate immunity discoveries that have happened outside of mammals. Of course, everything from RNAi to Toll to CRISPR. So that kind of middle part of the tree there is really, really overlooked, especially in virology and in immunology. And so we're really curious if by using these coanoflagellates, these single cellular pond scum type things, can we understand the foundations and origins of innate immunity that's been masked because of all these other effects in mammals? We have a very complicated immune system. So by pulling back in a simpler system, can we understand it? And she found a fantastic source of coanoflagellates right outside the lab. And so she can actually just go out there, sample every week, every day if she wants. If there's a virus floating by, we're going to find it. Um, so it's her hope that tiny swamp creatures could hold the keys to human immunology. Watch out for her. She's a force to be reckoned with. Um, so I'll just end there. I obviously have a lot of people to thank, lab members past and present I've mentioned. Um, all of the green and blue dots that I mentioned, in particular Laura Hooper, Sebastian Winter, and Kim Orth, who is my nominator, and she's here today. Um, collaborators have been key, particularly Terry Dermody. Funding, I've had much better luck with foundations. This is a little avant-garde and weird for NIH, so I'm really grateful for, for foundation support. And finally, uh, I'd like to thank my parents, and they're here, they're over there. Wave, mom, she's wearing the bright colors. <laughs> Um, they're absolutely wonderful, supportive people. Um, couldn't ask for anything better. So thank you. Okay, we have time for a few questions. Are there any questions? <clears throat> they're scared of infectious yeah, yeah, diseases. I don't know what you did. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very thank much. Thank you.